I'm Mason Mount. You're listening to the London is Blue podcast. All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to this will be part two of the youth season recap that we're doing with Phil from at Chelsea Youth. Uh, your host, as always, Brandon, joined by Nick and Dan. But Phil, we, we recapped the U23s. You had a great long article. Definitely, if you haven't listened to that, go back to this. But U18s is, is probably going to be a little bit different, wouldn't you say? What is kind of like the main difference between U23s and U18s, just to set the stage? The under-18s, not only are they younger, obviously, but it's more of an introduction into the world of full-time football. So you'll be 16 and having just left school and this is now your full-time occupation, whether you've signed a professional contract or not. You spent two years there and as we've seen, this team has been wildly successful over the last couple of years. Uh, it started with AD Vivash and then Joe Edwards and Jody Morris and now it's Ed Brand's team. They, the, the academy has a culture of success. They encourage winning as part of their development. That sort of, I wouldn't say goes out of the window under 23 level, but there's an acceptance that when you get to that stage of your career, players start to branch off in different directions and the team isn't quite as recognizable as it was been. The players, have, if, you, if you're playing together at under 18 level, you play together at 16, 15, 14, 13 before you start to fragment off. And that's why it becomes harder. All right. Well, I think the piece that I want to call out to set the stage for our conversation around the U18s is from your recap. And again, we'll have a link to that that we'll send out, but it's his uh, Phil's U18 season in review recap on uh, the Chelsea.net. Basically starts off with this. Morris's stunning 17-18 campaign was built on nice distribution of experience relative for the level of competition. 49% of all appearances were made by second-year players, those turning 18 during the season, 41% first years, and 10% by schoolboys. Brand's team is younger by comparison. His first years accounted for 49% of all matches played. 43% went to second years and 8% to schoolboys, even allowing for the slight increase in second-year representation in in the two matches left in a potential youth cup triumph this team was standing up to scrutiny at a younger overall age. And I think that that narrative point, Phil, is like this was going to be a challenge for the players and for Ed Brand. And they they really, from the way they kind of wrote it, rose to the occasion. They did. Um, it sounds like a, a mouthful when it's actually read out loud. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that team that Jody Morris cleaned up with, we, he won all three trophies in his first team, all four trophies in his second it was slightly older than this year, but it wasn't just slightly older. It had uh, Hudson Odoi, it had Reese Jane, it had Billy Gilmore. It had players who've gone on to do really, really impressive things in a very short span of time. And by way of comparison, the, the, the lead players from this group this season, Tino Andrew and Armando Broja, are only just starting to take baby steps into the first team. And they were only part of the Youth Cup run this year. Uh, Andrew and had, uh, sorry, Broja went through the first half of the season scored a bunch of goals, then he moved up to the development squad. And it's a younger team. It's, it's sort of flipped around the use of the first and second years. And it, it, 10% difference might not seem all that much, but over the course of the season, it is just generally a younger team. And Chelsea have always sort of erred towards the middle of the pack on this. They've never been the oldest in the league or the youngest in the league. Um, the teams are always going to get younger year on year just because of how good players are at the age of 15 and 16 now. But it just increases the challenge. So uh, we're talking about, you know, in, in our first episode, those who kind of made the jump up to the 23s or even into the first team. But what's the expected amount of rotation for this side uh, ahead of next season? So uh, we could put that into terms like what percentage will start as U18s in, in season 20 uh, and 21, uh, whenever that happens, uh, if you had to, to kind of take an educated guess? Okay, so some of them will be too old next season. Sam McClelland will be too old. Pierre Equa, George Nunn, Marcel Lewis, they're all moving up regardless. They can't play at this age group anymore. Some of them, like uh, James Clark and Jordan Aina, Ethan Wadey, Jake Askew, have their contracts for expiring this summer. We don't know if they're staying. Some of them will go. And then, like we spoke about in the under-23 piece, you'll have Lewis Bay, Levi Colwell, uh, Tino Livramento, who've started to make the journey up to the development squad already. They'll move on 
over the summer or very early next season, simply because the the new intake that come in is going to be 14 to 16 players again, and you need to make room for them. Those guys who are moving up, Bate and Livermento and Simons, they'll come back in for the Youth Cup, and it's the best on best competition. But it's going to be, for the most part, the the league campaign. It will be much like this season. Half of the team will be the young first years, and there'll be a little bit of smattering experience on top of that. So I think you mentioned a lot of names there of, I think, players who had some strong performances this season. Maybe just kind of jumping into that general question that we have, you know, who do you think or who are a couple of the players that you want to highlight as having really successful seasons uh, at this level? Maybe not any of the ones that we've you know, discussed in our U23s, but, you know, I think Bate in his, uh, in the season, you know, some of the season recaps looked really strong. Livermento also looks like he had a strong season. I'm not trying to lead you down just to talk about those two because I want to hear more, but if there's others you'd rather lead with, please feel free. Yeah, those two and Xavier Simons, they all moved on, but they, they played a little bit of under-18 football last season, so maybe slightly ahead of the curve again, whereas Levi Colwell didn't. He's a, a left-sided centre-half who was a mainstay of the under-18 team for most of the season. Then when Mark Gurhey and various other centre-halves were unavailable for the development squad, he moved up as a 16-year-old and was playing in the EFL Trophy against senior teams from Bristol Rovers. And not just holding his own, but playing to a really high standard. Um, so I'd probably say he took the biggest leap, given that he didn't any youth team experience last year. He went straight from under 16 into the under 18s this year as a first year and finished the year as first choice alongside Daniel Simeu for Andy Myers and the development squad. He did get injured right at the end of the season before COVID interrupted. Um, fortunately, he hasn't. The, the, the suspension of the season means he hasn't missed the run-in and the, the climax to celebration. He should be back fit for next season. So one of one of the people, or one of the players that I, I, I kind of was fascinated by through watching the highlights, and, and I think that we've, we've talked about a little bit before, is Dion Rankin, um, who strikes me as kind of a, a Jeremy Boga type um, can play kind of anywhere um, up front and at the blistering speed uh, compared to others at the level. Is he a guy, um, and, and not just through the goal scoring highlights, but is he a guy that you think has a decent chance to make the jump up um, to U23 sooner rather than later, or does he still need some development time uh, this year? Uh, he still needs a bit of development. He's the latest. He's a bit like Tarek Lamptey. He's a uh, you can't catch him when he gets up to full speed. He's mostly a right wing back, but they did some interesting stuff with him early in the season where they moved him in and played him as a number 10 to attack straight through the heart of the team. Why wouldn't you? The fast, the quickest way to goal is through the middle. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, they've used him at right wing back and left wing back and ideally he'll have a bit more opportunity to develop in the under 18s, but he's got that game breaking ability with just sheer speed and directness and that's always going to be a valuable valuable commodity so if they want to use him as an impact sub at 23s to start with and then bring him on slowly it sounds like a good plan all right well i think i mean well i'm just trying to catch up on some of those dan rankin highlights blistering fast is is pretty accurate i would say um again being hard to predict with 50 percent turnover as you look at anchors for next season, um, and maybe you can talk about the captaincy at these levels too, um, because I'm not sure if it's one of those things that rotates a little bit is more of a, an experience, an educational thing, or if it's much more traditional in the sense of you're a captain, that's it. It is for the Youth Cup. They'll designate a Youth Cup captain who is usually one of the more experienced players. It was Andrew in this year. It was Billy Gilmore last year and Reese James the year before that. It's usually a headline name in the team. 
one of the the best players in the team and somebody the academy identifies with in the league it's usually a bit different they'll have a, a nominal guy who if you're going to play most of the games he'll be the captain but they will move it around from time to time it was mostly Sam McClellan this season he's very much the prototypical leader John Terry style they gave it to Xavier Simons on a couple of occasions and sometimes if they want to bring out a, a bit of personality or leadership in somebody who they know has it but doesn't have the confidence to demonstrate it they'll give them the captaincy once or twice a season I love using it as an as a tool as well like you said I mean we all know how quiet Reese James is but does is such a loud player on the pitch and again using this as a way of hey you're gonna go talk to referees you're gonna go talk to the other team you're gonna do a little team talk before the match like you said it pulls that skill set you know, out of them because unless they get reps to try it or pushed out of their comfort zone to do it, you know, Reese James is going to be happy to just sit back and let someone else do it. But again, the upside is now he can see himself as a competent leader and will have extra confidence. Um, You know, clearly it worked for Billy Gilmore as he runs around telling people where to go, just like a mini Jorginho. Uh, So I, I love hearing that, Phil. Well, well, part of it too, fellow, right, is is the fact that sometimes they choose a player regardless of, you know, whether they have exceptional leadership or, or um, crazy outgoing personalities that the other players just respect, right? I mean, it's, you know, whether for their talent or just the way they kind of go about their business. So is that the case with the McClelland or is he, you, you mentioned that he's kind of the JT-esque person. Is it a combination of personality and work ethic is it is kind of demonstrating on the pitch where players should go like can you maybe dive in a little bit into that yeah it, mcclelland is very obvious if you think of all the the hallmarks of a good leader the, the vocal the encouragement the the enthusiasm to lead the team the the extrovert personality on the pitch at the very least the, the, the he ticks all of those boxes and usually most captains will but you you might try and move it around here or there if McLaren's not playing then you try to find somebody else who is the captain Xavier Simons isn't quite the same as as McLaren is as a leader he's more of a lead by example player and that's that's versatility in in leadership and intangibles is something you only find out when you put them to that situation yeah, I know we, we've talked about a couple of these players, you know, going up to U23 next year. Uh, it's particularly, I want to go back, maybe just touch on uh, Lewis Bate first. You know, obviously, I think he had a, had a really strong season this year. And how do you think his game is going to need to improve? And what are you kind of projecting is going to maybe be some some challenges for him that he'll have to acclimatize to from the from the U23 level? Firstly, I mean, Bates, one of those players that doesn't need the captain's armband, as we were just talking about, to be a leader. He is that sort of person. You don't need to give him the captaincy. You know he's going to go out there and lead anyway. As he steps up, he's going to face the same sort of challenges as Billy Gilmore because he's short. He's not quite as slight as Billy, and he puts himself about a little bit more, but he's not going to be a big man when it comes to getting into his early 20s and when he finishes growing. So the journey is about working out how you need to adapt your game to overcome the challenges that you encounter. And we've seen that Billy is, is, is uh, he's unafraid to, to put himself about to get physical, to, to relish the, the battle of a Premier League match. And that's because he's been able to develop that from when he arrived at Chelsea. It's gone through the same process that Bates going through now. And you just have to find yourself as a player because both of them have got undoubted technical ability that's not going to be in question at any point in their careers. It's just about making sure that the physical and mental side of the game stays at the same pace. And then do you feel like it's a, you know, what maybe are there similar challenges for Livermento going into kind of that U23 level? Um, you know, what, what, what's his pathway looking like as he kind of graduates out of the, the U18 level? It's a little bit different for him because as a as a wing back you've got the athleticism you've got the ability to separate yourself from the pack even against adults if you're quick you're quick and you're going to pose them problems um you can be direct with it and with those sorts of players you just need to refine your end product you need to make sure that you're making a difference 
uh, in the attacking third, you need to make sure that your defensive responsibilities aren't being shirked. You just need to show that you're rounding out your game so that a first-team manager can rely on you and not have to say, oh, I'm not certain if he's going to be up to our standard right now. Another, another one that uh, frequently was a part of the, the highlight reel, um, and I think, again, may not be the biggest – uh, player on the pitch is Marcel Lewis. Um, can you can you talk about maybe how he projects forward? I, you know, I know that he's kind of a, a flexible player and and where he can play, but certainly as a as a center forward and, and then what we know is a kind of the traditional center forward sense at, at Chelsea. You know, he's he's going to be much smaller than than what we're kind of used to if he projects into the first team. So um, maybe give a little insight on on Marcel Lewis. He's a really interesting player because he he joined from Cambridge as a 14-year-old and was an attacking midfielder, a wide player who, when he came to Chelsea, started moving into more of a, a number 10 sort of role because the academy don't tend to use wingers quite so much. They use two number 10s. But over the course of the last year, he's sort of become a hybrid 10 slash scrappy midfielder he he comes deep a lot more than your average attacking midfielder does and he gets stuck in he wins the ball back and then leads the transition and it's it's really really cool to see that he's got all of these weapons in his arsenal and it's I'm, I'm interested as to where he eventually settles down because I think he could make a really good box-to-box midfielder I'm not quite sure that he has enough to separate him from the pack as an outstanding attacking midfielder in, in being creative in tight spaces in and around the edge of the box. He's really good from dead balls. He's a fantastic free kick taker. But from open play, I think that because he's good and because he relishes getting stuck in and being part of the press and winning the ball back, I think he'll make a really good box-to-box midfielder eventually. But that's what we're going to find out over the next season or two. And it's still part of the journey. You, the older you get and the closer to senior football you get, the more you nail down where you're going to play. Yeah, definitely. Again, opportunity comes where, where can they go? Um, wow. All right. Well, I'm just, as I'm trying to wrap my head around all that, um, bringing us back around, we, we'd asked you just a little bit ago, who do you think the anchors of the team will be next season? And we talked about the captains and things like that. Um, is it reasonable to ask you to predict a player of the season for next season or <laughs> with all in, in like now knowing all of the, kind of transition that happens on this team it's it's hard because the player this thing could be somebody like Lewis Pay or Tino Lieberman because they'll if if all being well they have another strong youth cup run they go all the way those guys will be front and center to it but the player of the season will be somebody who gets 20 to 25 appearances in Saturday morning football so it'll be somebody from the new intake so you've had someone like Charlie Webster or Harvey Vale who've made a few appearances so far this season as schoolboys. Charlie is the England under-16 captain. He's got a lot of pedigree. Harvey is an England under-17 international just because he's a 2003-born. So they're a little bit ahead of the line. Like Sam Milling Jr., who is subject to quite a bit of transfer speculation at the minute, and it doesn't it's uncertain as to whether he's going to be a part of that group or not. If he does stay, it could be him because he's played more than a dozen times for the under 18s this season. It'll be some more likely to be somebody from the first years to come in who sticks and and gets the player of the season because of their broader body of work. Fair. Totally fair. We're going to we're going to let that one go. And Dan, just like we did last time, the table's a little bit different here. So Chelsea are in third, but they've got a game in hand, right? So Fulham Seem to be running away with a little bit. Uh, do I have points on here? 40 points. Uh, West Ham, 37. Chelsea, 36. So, again, win our game in hand that probably is not going to be played. We'd be in second just to, to give you. But talk about the strength in, in London right there with Fulham, West Ham, Chelsea right at the top. Uh, but the record being 11-1, three drawn, and two lost. So... Now, where do we have to go? If it's not the players and we looked at the table. Well, we also had that not only with the, the U18s, but they were also in the youth cup, uh, FA Youth Cup semifinalists, and they were going to be hosting uh, Manchester United for a chance to play in another final. And so I think 
maybe looking at, you know, we talked about, you know, Myers having a kind of a first year run with the U23s, similar situation with Brand uh, and Brand taking over the U18s. Um, and uh, you called this out in your article, Phil, I mean, almost on a little bit of a similar trajectory to, to Morris's side previously, you know, just how, how good was, or, you know, how successful do you think Brand was in, in his year one with this side? If they'd have won that game in hand, which was away to Reading, who were tenth of twelve, then they'd have been within a point of Fulham going into the last five games. And though the season's now been cancelled, they would have been away to Fulham in the penultimate game of the season. So it was essentially a title decider. So they had everything in their hands to go and win the title again. It's in previous years nobody's been able to keep up with them, and their record this year isn't necessarily any worse than in previous years. It's just that Fulham and West Ham have had really, really impressive years in their own right. So you can only look after yourself and not worry about anybody else. And from that regard, Brand has done a terrific job. The team were unbeaten at Christmas. They had a little bit of a sticky patch in January. They lost away to West Ham and then they lost to Aston Villa. But defeats are going to happen. To go unbeaten for an entire half of the season with a younger group than any of the predecessors, it's it's, it's really good. The under-18s are generally the same sort of style year on year. The academy's philosophy is a lot stronger at the younger age groups. They stick to the the bigger picture, and then the coach adds a flavour of personality based on their own preferences. So it's not a radical departure from what we've seen in the past from Andy Myers last year or from Jody Morris or whoever. But I think they could have been confident going into the run-in that will never be played now, knowing that a win at Fulham would have won the Southern League. They would have played Manchester City for the overall national title and the Youth Cup, which still hasn't officially been cancelled. Um, I can't see how it's going to be played, but it's right now the match is still pending. Technically, right? That's where we're at right now. They're just waiting. Yeah, there's no way that Manchester United are going to come to Stamford Bridge and play a match. If the Premier League can't work themselves out, then that's a semi final. <laughs> and then the final would be against Man City or Blackburn. And so it's again. Somebody, if, if Chelsea win that, they'd have to go up halfway th- up the country. And as much as we'd like to see Chelsea win another Youth Cup, I think there are far bigger priorities going on now. Yeah, that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, do you think there will be quite a bit of consistency at the the top with coaching staffs and things like this as we kind of look ahead to next season? Uh, yeah, Brand and James Simmons should be the manager and assistant manager again. Chelsea tend to work in three-year cycles of this. It's partially by design because it keeps everybody challenged. You don't get into too much of a groove where you be, you be, you're the coach for 10 years or so. Um, part of the academy's philosophy is to develop people and staff as well as players. So they're encouraged to go on and do their UEFA B, UEFA A, UEFA Pro licenses, move from under 18s to under 23s to the first team. So we've seen Jody Morris and Joe Edwards go up to that level already, but not just them. You've got Chris Jones up there. You've got James Russell on the coaching staff. He splits his time between the academy and first team goalkeeping duties. And so two more years and Ed might move up and James Simmons might take the team as manager. Or you might have the under-16 coaches, uh, Jack Measure and Andy Ross. They might eventually move up to the under-18s. And I, I wrote about this on on the Chelsea uh, a month or so ago, that the, the younger coaching ranks are just as promising as the players. You've got some players who some more of the you might be familiar with from previous under-18 teams because they didn't quite have the playing career. They've gone uncoached and they'll be coming through in the next decade. Um, I don't think we're going to see too much in terms of change this summer, but every three years or so, it seems about right. I guess a, a final question from from me, Phil, would be: you know, if we if we kind of look at <clears throat> restocking, you know, the the trout pond with all these promising players, you know, we we obviously are kind of seeing that at first team level that that you know a few years ago we kind of projected the Reese Jameses and Cal Nelson Joyce and all, all these folks were going to come up. Do you feel like it's still as stacked, you know, all the way back to the, you know, U15 levels that are going to move through over the next couple of years as it was a few years back? The the depth of talent will mean that there's there's definitely players on the way. I don't know if you can ever get to a point where you have as many outstanding players as they did at the end of the 17-18 season because that team 
when we when all is said and done is going to be remarkable i mean they, they've already done some pretty good things in in the professional game and they're all still no older than 20 um it might be a little bit of a slower go for some of these boys but we, we could have said that about a few others a year ago we wouldn't have mentioned broger's name in first team competition whatsoever and that's that's the beauty of this somebody can just surge out of the pack at any given moment but similarly you can have somebody come along like Fikayo Tomori who was wasn't necessarily looked at as a surefire first teamer when he was 16 17 or 18 he was a good player he won youth cups and then he went on a few loans and even at those clubs if you ask Brighton fans or if you ask Hull City fans that he didn't exactly excel there but it's part of the journey and right now he's a fabulous prospect he's an England international and looks for all the world a, a 10-year player for Chelsea tell you what I mean yeah I'll say this for part three actually because I think we've wrapped on the 18s we are starting to go in a different direction but that is what part three is for the remaining scholars looking ahead things that have come to my mind recently that need answers, but this is not the time. So Phil, thank you for running us in depth through the 18s and the, and the, the management staff. Uh, we appreciate it. Everyone go follow Phil on Chelsea youth. Definitely worth they a read. Already are. They already are. It's probably true. Statistically speaking, uh, but we'll be back again. Part three uh, to wrap up our chat with Phil. So until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.